Waiting for Godot is one of the most famous plays of the 20th century. In it, two characters named Vladimir and Estragon pass the time on a country road as they wait for a man named Godot to arrive. The play is famously weird and mysterious and open-ended, prompting the question, what is this story about? The play massively interests me as an actor, because it's brilliant and really, really fun to perform, but it also interests me as a man with a background in philosophy, because it's part of the theatre of the absurd. Absurdism is a philosophical movement that wound up influencing a lot of 20th century art through a rather interesting story. Alors, bienvenue à Paris, dans l'entre-deux-guerres. C'est un temps de culture et de pensée florissante. Voilà, le célèbre philosophe Jean-Paul Sartre et Simone de Beauvoir. Et l'artiste Salvador Dali, vous avez l'air en bonne forme, Sal. Et aussi, en Paris, en ce moment, le dramaturge Samuel Beckett et le philosophe Albert Camus. Samuel Beckett was an Irishman who moved to Paris in 1928 and sank into this cultural milieu that was going on. At the time, it was very fashionable for philosopher and creative artist to be fused in one person. Philosophers were writing literature and writers were writing philosophy. And then something very bad happened. Something called World War II. France is invaded by the Nazis. And so philosopher, creative artist, and resistance fighter become fused into single persons, as both Samuel Beckett and Albert Camus join the underground resistance. And this is the context in which Camus writes his most famous work, The Myth of Sisyphus, in 1942. The book asks, how should we confront the absurd? The absurd, with a capital A, is a technical term in Camus' writing. It refers to the contradiction between humanity's desire to find meaning in the universe and the universe itself, which is completely meaningless. And once you realize that life is pointless, but you are compelled to find a point to it anyway, Camus says there are seven possible responses. Number one, you could kill yourself. Number two, you could try to ignore it by filling your life with pleasures of food and drink and uh, company. Number three, you could just deny it. For instance, you could be religious and say, no, there is meaning in life because the meaning comes from God. Or you could be an existentialist and say that maybe you don't go in for organized religion so much, but in some sense you create your own meaning in life. Camus saw both of those as forms of denial. He says you're still not really looking life in the face because ultimately the universe is meaningless. That's why he didn't like to be called an existentialist, although his work does have some themes in common with that. The fourth way of confronting the absurd is to become an actor and try to live lives that pretend to have meaning within the context of stories. The fifth is to become another kind of artist, like a painter, somebody who creates works of art that have meanings as a substitute for living a life with a meaning. And the sixth is to become a political person, like a conqueror, somebody for whom power and government and the right way to use those things fills up their time and gives them meaning. All of these methods Camus considers and ultimately rejects. But the seventh and final method of confronting the absurd, the one that he actually recommends, is acceptance. Accepting that life is pointless, but that you are compelled to find a point to it anyway. But this acceptance isn't a kind of sad, passive, depressing acceptance. Camus thought it was an act of resistance against the universe itself. You look life square in the face. You don't deny it, you don't distract yourself, and you don't give in. And you live life anyway in full knowledge of its pointlessness. In Greek mythology, Sisyphus was doomed to roll a boulder up a mountain every day and then watch it roll back down again every night forever. And Camus says the only way Sisyphus can really be happy is if he accepts the pointlessness of that task and he decides to own it and go down the mountain every night smiling. You can see how living in Nazi-occupied France informed 
a lot of these ideas. This feeling of fighting what looked like an unwinnable battle against uncaring forces indulging in pointless, inhuman destruction was a feeling that Camus was very familiar with day to day. The final line of the book is, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. And then we come to 1953 and the premiere performance of Waiting for Godot. A l'époque, c'était en français, en attendant Godot, the English translation came two years later. In it, Vladimir and Estragon are engaged in what seems to be a never-ending, pointless and an often repetitive task, waiting for Godot. Waiting for Godot is the whole reason that they are there, and yet he never turns up. So their situation is rather like someone else's we've just met. The play is about what people do when confronted with the absurd, with the compulsion to find meaning where no meaning exists. And throughout the play, the characters try all of the methods of confronting the absurd that Camus suggests. They talk about killing themselves, but they don't. They talk about attempting some sexual pleasure or becoming more physically comfortable with food or with their shoes. Vladimir considers some religious ideas at various points, but they don't really seem to satisfy him. All of the characters are, of course, metatextually played by actors, and so they are examining that way of confronting it too. Vladimir tries singing at one point, and various popular interpretations of the play present the two as being rather like a music hall double act generally. One of the other characters, Pozzo, has a slave called Lucky. Having that power over him seems to be what gives his life a lot of meaning, or at least structure, but we see by Act 2 that it hasn't really made him better off. By the end of the play, Didi and Gogo seem doomed to wait for Godot forever. They don't seem to be able to accept the fact that if he exists at all, he's not coming. Interestingly, there is one character in the play who I think maybe does accept the absurd. They are charged with carrying a heavy burden, but when offered comfort and distraction, willingly go back to that burden and pick it up again. It's lucky the so-called slave. I think, at this particular stage of my artistic career, and I reserve the right to change my mind later, but I think that you could read Lucky as being Camus' model of the absurdist hero. Somebody who knows that their life is a pointless, horrible chore, but who gets on with it anyway. And when Lucky finally speaks to Vladimir Estragon and Pozzo, they, and the audience, are incapable of understanding a word he's saying. You see what I mean? Waiting for Godot is just the staged version of the myth of Sisyphus. It's a work of philosophy presented as a play. Now, of course, if you're an actor, none of that tells you how you should play the roles. There's a big difference between delivering a lecture on symbolism in Beckett and, you know, actually getting up and making somebody feel something. But if you're going to go and see Waiting for Godot as an audience member, which you should, then I hope that this helps you understand it a little better. Patreon.com slash PhilosophyTube is where you can resist the absurd by helping me afford rent and food. I could really use some assistance with that, so anything you can give is gratefully appreciated, and don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>